Good. Thumbs up. Okay. okay this week uh, we're going to talk about the Heimdall Heimskvith. Uh, that's a um, it's kind of a precursor to Eager's Feast. And Eager's Feast is one of those very interesting tales that uh, that has the underlying effect of humanizing the deities that uh, thousands of years of individuals consider to be holy. It was one of the last nails in the coffin for, um, for this ancient way of life and ancient faith. This one in particular deals with the parents. We've been discussing the Reagan's Mall, the Fafnis Mall, um, the Hind Yoth, and there's a recurring theme there of who we deal with. There's a saying that if you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. And I think it's really strongly supported by a lot of what we go over here. In the Reagan's Mall, we have a young man that is raised by a, a, a person that takes him under his wing and his tutelage, and every single day he's telling him some kind of poisonous aspect, some kind of hateful idea, some kind of nonsense about how he's a victim. And he finally gets this young hero to act on his behalf because it's something he can't do. In the middle of that, when he does finally take a life, there's a stunning realization that he's been suckered, he's been bamboozled. And all of that's fine and good because you know he grows out of it. We see the steps that he takes to grow to become something better. We see what he has to deal with to be a man and stand on his own two feet. But there's another aspect of this with regards to how we grow up and how we develop. And this tale right here is about Tyr. Now Tyr, as we know, he was probably the original Sky Father, if you go with your proto-Indo-European Aryan kind of ideology that originated in Persia. Tyr was the one half of the divine being. And his name carried forward into Tiwaz, which is a rune of, of justice and authority, but it's also the North Star. The North Star has always been named after Tyr. And in the rune poems, it says that for noblemen and princes, may the North Star ever provide guidance and truth. So there's, a, there's something that's lasted, that's, that's gone through all of time to kind of offer us a direction. It's no accident that the Tiwaz rune is an arrow pointing in a direction. Tyr is an individual that has gone out and justified and made sacrifice of himself for the safety and security of the people around him and the people that he loved, his tribe, the Aesir. He sacrificed a hand, <laughs> he has stood up, he has been that constant source of strength, guidance and protection, solid friendship, and earned a place at the table. He has gone out and been successful. For our day and age, when the young son goes out and is successful, when the daughter goes out and becomes successful, when they go out and they achieve some kind of greatness, and they got to go home. Sometimes when they return home, the parents may not recognize what that looks like, and that's kind of a scary thing. And on the flip side of that coin, there's the son that comes home that has just absolutely fallen on his face. I happen to have lived a life where I've seen both sides of that coin. Where I've gone out and been so wildly successful that my father simply could not recognize what any of that was. And then in the abrupt about face, gone out and fallen down so hard that my father could not recognize anything that it was. He had one simple kind of idea that stuck with so he would be average and safe for his entire life, constant. Now, where do we receive the instruction to turn it around? Where do we receive the instruction to go out and be successful? If the only thing we ever have is instruction on how to just be average. Now, if there's anything of faith ought to be able to do for an individual, Individual. It's to help them move beyond where they are so they can become something more, something that satisfies those desires, those burning ideas of greatness, of accomplishment, of achievement that reside in the heart of every man. To be somebody worth remembering, to be someone worthy of that respect that we've all worked so hard to achieve. How do we do that when all of our instruction has just been for average? This tale is a tale of how we negotiate that obstacle. 
And there are very clear warning signs in it of what it looks like when someone wants to sabotage that effort to go out and become something more. We see, and we'll get into it as we go on. And it starts off very simply. It starts off with Odin and all the gods. Of old, the gods made feast together. In Greek, they saw it. Here, say, did they were. They're looking around for sustenance. They're going to have a good time. Twigs they shook and blood they tried. Rich, fair, and eager's hall they found. Eager is an ancient giant that governs the sea. <laughs> it is no accident that they find that rich fair in the sea. Water is one of the most important substances to life and spirituality we might find on this planet. It is a conduit for spirituality in about every faith that you might look at, from a Christian baptism to the blessing of a baby, to even drinking water. Everything that walks, talks, lives, breathes, or crawls is composed largely of water. It is that electric circuit for spirituality and life in no uncertain terms. And here we have a real clear identification that even the divine beings find that in the halls of eager, in the great kingdoms under the sea, in that very cauldron of life itself, that's where they're going to find the most sustenance. That's where they're going to find the uh, things that, that move them forward, that allow them to develop, that allow them to grow. <laughs> and it's no accident that the mountain dweller said, Mary is boyhood. So the man sitting on the mountain, sitting there, Mary is boyhood, not a care in the world, but soon like a blinded man, he seemed. It's very hard to etch out a living sitting on top of a mountain. It's lonely. And when you're looking down on everything from a high place, what joy is there to be found by yourself? The son of Ig gazed in his eyes, for the gods a feast shalt thou forthwith get. So the next stanza clarifies what he's talking about, that the word wielder toil for the giant worked. Eager was put to work. Odin says, look, you're going to provide for us a feast. This doesn't sit so well with the king of the sea. And so revenge on the gods he sought. <laughs> he threw a little carrot out there for him. He bade Sif's mate, this is Thor, the kettle bring there and for ye all much ale shall I brew. So he promises him this great good time, this feast, this wonderful thing, but you got to find this special cauldron. He throws a puzzle at the gods. <laughs> the far-famed ones could not find it, and the holy gods could get it nowhere. Till in truthful wise did tears speak forth, and helpful counsel to Lorithi gave. So we come into a situation in life where we understand that there is a great cauldron from which all of this wonderful stuff might boil over. It might, and you know, it's even, even in Christianity, it says, given it'll be pressed down, shaken, given back to you, boiling over. All of the great cauldrons of life are boiling over with water. Now this giant, gets a case of the red ass because Odin says, look, you're going to do this for us whether you like it or not. Now they got to go find this. Tyr knows where it's at, but there's a challenge to him to get it. He has gone out and built for himself the life he wishes to live. He has the successful people around him that whose company he enjoys and who he prefers. Friends and warriors and lovers and all of the good things in life. But he knows where that kettle is. And he's gonna go have to he's gonna have to go home and deal with it. Sometimes going home may not always be the easiest of things to do. So he tells Thor, there dwells to the east of Elivagar, Hymir the wise at the end of heaven. A kettle, my father fierce doth own, a mighty vessel of mile and depth. There it is, his daddy's got it at the end of heaven. So we're outside those positive good grounds where the gods may grow and develop and offer benefit and boon and guidance and purpose and direction for man at the end of heaven. There's a being there who's got what he's looking for. Thor spake, may we win, dost thou think this whirler of water? Tear spake, I friend, we can, if cunning we are. <laughs> Tear's got to go home and face his fathers. What better partner is there to do it than Thor, the warder of men? that very being who is the union of sky and earth. Thor is, among all things, he is the protector of man. 
<laughs> Forward that day with speed they fared from Asgard came they to Eagle's home. The ghost with horns bedecked he guarded. Then they sped to the hall where Heimer dwelt. So they get passage, they go. Tyr's got a great challenge. He's got to go deal with his father. Who would you want at your side when you have to go home and deal with a, what's probably going to be a fairly unpleasant occurrence? You're going to go in there all brash and full of yourself, talking about what you've accomplished? Are you going to go in there with the kind of faith that if you handle it right, do the right thing, it's going to come out okay? You're going to have to have some kind of faith in dealing with these family relationships because this is where the instruction that governs your entire life originates. And if you deviate from that, you better have a damn good reason because every time someone deviates from that basic instruction we get growing up, if they fall on their face, people are ready for it and expect them. If they go out and they succeed, he's the rarity, he's the example, I hope he fails. Nine times out of 10, that's what you're gonna hear. So Tyr chooses wisely. He picks the order of men to help him negotiate this journey of dealing with this family relationship. The youth found his granddam that greatly he loathed. So this is Tyr. He is the youth. He found his grandmother and greatly he loathed her. A full 900 heads she had, and the other one with gold came forth, and the bright-browed one brought beer to her son. So grandmother is an old biddy, but she's paid attention to everything. And more than likely, when you get an old biddy in the family like that, and they got, it might seem like they have 900 heads because they have all the information and all the dirt and all the nastiness that's going on. And they will spread that shit to make sure that everyone feels the same way they do. Old, tired, bitter, and resentful. But there is a, there is a ray of hope there. The bright-browed one brought beer to her son. Now, in all of the lore, in all of this stuff, in, in just about everything you look at, there is a woman, some divine feminine, some idea of femininity that brings to the son a cup, the lady with the mead cup. She carries it around from the king to the honored guests, and that tradition runs across the entire religions of the world and every mythology. It is the role of a, of a bride-browed mother to offer that drink to her son, to her king, to the lords. <laughs> Kinsmen of giants beneath the kettle will I set ye both, ye heroes bold. She knows what he's done. She knows he's gone out and made something of himself. He has cut the apron strings. He's not depending on his mom to take care of him. He has gone out and become something to be worthy of respect. And she gives him that. What great blessing would that be? For many a time, my dear loved mate, to guest is wroth, wrathful and grim of mind. This is a violation of hospitality. When Tacitus wrote about Germania, he said that very few folk in the world offered the kind of hospitality that the tribes of Northern Europe offered. When someone showed up in a village, they would feast at someone's home until it was all gone. Then they would go to the next home and they would continue to feast. Hospitality was a very special thing because in those days, there were many people that wandered around <laughs> and they wandered under the guise of offering wisdom. They were barred, but it might be Odin himself. It might be Freya herself. It might be some very special. If you offered hospitality to a stranger, if you were confident enough in your ability to protect your home, that you could show generosity and hospitality to those strangers that come to your home, who knows what kind of benefit you might have. This man, her mate, is an ass to people that show up at his door. What are you doing here? What do you want? So right there we get this idea that this is a selfish individual who's not real sure he wants strangers coming around because they might, well, who knows what they might do, but probably ain't gonna be good. When the greatest threat might really be an exposure of the weaknesses that a man who can't protect his home like that might have. It flies in the face of everything that we wanna believe. <laughs> Late to his home, the misshapen Heimer. So already we know he's misshapen. He's not 
the, the tall, stunningly good looking individual. This is a misshapen, bent over, stooped. The giant harsh from his hunting came. The icicles rattle as he came in for the fellow's chin forest frozen was. So he's out there, he's in the cold, he's hunting. He's probably not in a good mood. It doesn't say that he's brought anything home, but here he comes. Hail to thee, Heimer, good thoughts mayest thou have. So already she's trying to encourage and boost him up. Here has thy son to thine hall now come. For him we have waited, his way was long. So she reminds this man that this boy has gone out and done something fantastic. Look at the success of the individuals he runs around with. Look at what he's accomplished. Look at who he is. He has grown into something fantastic. And with him fares the foeman of Roth, the friend of mankind, and viewer they call him. The friend of mankind, he is the warder of men. So this man has come home to face his father, and he's brought with him those aspects of faith that reinforce the idea of his accomplishments. He is going to protect himself from those comments, those hateful stares, those snide remarks from anybody in his family because he has faith in who he is and what he's accomplished, and he makes sure that he's there to protect him from that. <laughs> See where under the gable they sit, behind the beam do they hide themselves. The beam at the glance of the giant broke and the mighty pillar in pieces fell. So already he's casting hateful looks. The instant this misshapen, cold giant is presented with someone who has stepped outside of the guidance that he always had, that the guidance that he lives by, and has achieved something great, he's going to give him a hateful stare. Eight fell from the ledge, and one alone, the hard-hammered kettle of all, was whole. Forth came they then, and his foes he sought, the giant old and held with his eyes. So all of the kettles broke except for the one they want. Many times when we want to move forward in life as men, we're going to seek that one hard, solid idea that we are worthy from our fathers. You know, there's nothing else we can gain from this tale. It's that this man has brought his faith to his home to rest on his accomplishments so he might get that sense of approval from his father, that his dad might say, you're man enough. That doesn't happen very much in this day and age. <laughs> much sorrow his heart foretold when he saw the giantess foeman come forth on the floor. Then of the steers did they bring in three, their flesh to boil did the giant bid. So he's still under the rules of hospitality. So these people are there, the wife is saying, you're not gonna do this, you're gonna act right, you're gonna be nice. But in his heart, he knows he's not very happy about it. There's some, uh, he's sad, he's upset, but he's gonna feed them. So they bring in the steers. By a head was each the shorter huge, so they cut off their heads, and the beasts to the fire straight they bore. So they sent them, cut off their heads and sent them straight to the fire. The husband of Sif, ere to sleep, he went alone to oxen of Hymer's age. So Thor indulged himself. So he's kind of poking fun at him already. To the comrade Hori of Prongnir did Horithi's meal full mighty seem. Next time at Eve we three must eat the food we have the hunting spoil. So Right there, he's going to challenge him. You're not going to eat all my food. Um, tomorrow night, you want to eat like that, we're going to go kill something. So the, 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 the game is on there. Now, in the tale of Eager's Feast, <laughs> in the prose edda, that little scene goes much deeper than that. Um, what you have is an individual who has offered the best of what he has, and all of a sudden he realizes it might not really be good enough for this faith I want to follow. But instead of trying to measure up, instead of trying to change or try to grow or try to develop or try to do or be better, he throws up a challenge. Well, I'm not going to do anything better but what I'll do is I'll challenge you and we'll go out hunting and we'll see if we can get it somewhere else because I'm not going to sacrifice more of who I am and what I've accomplished just because you're greedy. <laughs> this kind of thought process is poisonous in more ways than one. Whenever we're faced with the challenge of faith, whenever we're faced 
with the idea of someone doing better because they deviated from the path. All too often, instead of trying to measure up, instead of trying to uh, be worth more, instead of trying to produce more or work harder, we want to cheat. Well, I'm not going to give anything more of who I am. Let's go over here and take it from over here. You cannot sidestep the patterns of growth that are outlined in faiths around the world. Every person has to develop those aspects of themselves that are most worthy of respect. When you get to a point in life where you keep finding these things holding you back, it's time to cut them off. It's time to sacrifice those vestiges of who we are that keep us from becoming more. And right here we have Hymir refusing to do that. In the face of the warrior of men and a very successful son, he's going to dig in his heels and continue to bitch, whine, piss, moan, and complain about politics or whatever. When you go home and you're sitting there and you're trying to do your best and you sit around with the family and you're hearing those same old hateful, negative, denigrating comments about any kind of thing and you make that realization that there's nothing more for me here to learn. It's a hard thing to do to remember how to continue to love those individuals. And yet that's our family. That's what we're supposed to do. Do we rub it in their face? Or do we continue to give them love as best we can? For myself, with my own father, the best that I could ever do was love him at arm's length. And that's, that's just one of the things we have to deal with in life. <clears throat> As we go on, a challenge is met, a competition is, is wager. They're going to go fishing. They're going to have a fishing contest because more often than not, men like that are completely engrossed in the ego, how great they are based on thinking alone. They may not have ever done a single thing but been average ass factory worker but they can tell you how to run the entire world. Well, now here, the faith is going to take him up on that challenge. I'm a great fisherman, so let's go find out what you got. So the faith, the warder of men, Thor, this protector of, of Tyr in this challenging environment, says, okay, go to the herd. If thou hast it in mind, to thou slayer of giants, thy bait to seek, for there for there thou soon mayest find me, thanks, bait from the ox and easy to get. Swift to the wood the hero went, till before an ox all black he found. From the beast of slayer, from the beast the slayer of giants broke, the fortress high of his double horns. So that's a fancy way to say Thor went out there, found a black ox, cut off his head. Now he's got some bait. <laughs> the head of an ox is a big damn thing. To go fish with that. It's pretty impressive. The ox are those things that allowed men, the, the domestication of which allowed men to build civilizations. Faith just cut the head off of that thing, and he's going to go fishing. There's a radical change that's involved in something of that nature. When your faith begins to cut off those things that allow men to build civilization, what does that say to us? What do we need to be learning from that? What do we got to be asking ourselves? Is part of this building of civilization of these individuals who are thoroughly engrossed in how great they are because of the way they think, is that a bad, bad thing? Technology run amok, AI, artificial intelligence, all of that nonsense. Perhaps we ought to be thinking about those kinds of things. Should we be letting these lesser men who've never accomplished anything, who ride on the shoulders of greater men to be building the technology that will dominate our future? Or should we be cutting the head off of the engine that drives the building of that kind of civilization? Because right there, we have the warder of men showing us an action in which he does just that. But it's done to lure something even better out. Heimer spake, <laughs> thy works, methinks, are worse by far. Thou steerer of ships than 
than when still thou sittest. So there's some stuff missing out of that. <laughs> but there's some boasts that go in, uh, in, the, in the other manuscripts. Snorri's extended paraphrase of the story, Heimer declines to go fishing with Thor on the ground that the latter is too small a person to be worth bothering about. So he attempts to insult him. You're not big enough. You're not good enough to go fishing with me. Okay. <laughs> so he's building his ego. Has never done anything with Thor. Has never competed with him or arm wrestled with him or anything. He just says, no, you're too little. I'm not going to try. I'm not even going to try. More often than not, that's what you'll find from the egotistically driven individual. I'm not even going to try to even bother with you. You would freeze, he says, if you stayed out in mid-ocean as long as I generally do. Ah, so see, you can't even measure up. I'm not going to prove it, but I am going to talk about it. And that kind of character assassination is the hallmark of the individual who's thoroughly engrossed in a pattern of of life that is centered around how great they think they are. The man that comes home after work, sits down on the couch and bitches about what kind of idiots these people are. I do it all the time. <laughs> and I got to catch myself at it and I got to stop. But it's, it's, it's what I was taught to do. The entire time I was growing up, I heard my grandfather and my father and my uncle and all of these members of my family, the most important thing that they did in their life was go to work and earn a paycheck to support their family. And every day they hated it. Every day they bitched about it. But the best instruction any of them could give me was to go do the same thing. And when I broke out of that pattern, now all of a sudden, well, what's that going to, you know, I don't understand. But we see real clear right there, I'm not even going to try to measure. I'm not even going to try to, to do it because you're probably not even worth it. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing he does is he, he talks about the word bait. He says the word literally means chaff, hence any small bits. Heimer means that Thor should be collecting dung for bait. So in those three lines, he continues to insult him. He's not not ready to try and challenge him. He's not ready to see if he can measure up. He's just going to make fun of him and call him a weenie and all this other stuff. So, okay. Thor goes out there and cuts off the head because the building of a civilization along that train of thought should go no further. The Lord of the Goats bade the ape begotten farther to steer the steed of the rollers, but the giant said that his will forsooth longer to row was little enough. So Thor saying, look here, quit being a jackass. Let's go on out a little bit further. He is the Lord of the, of the goats, is to, is the two that pull his chariot, bade the ape begotten. You call him an ape. Keep going, buddy. Let's see what we got. Two whales on the hook did mighty Hymer soon pull up on a single cast. In the stern, the kinsmen of Odin sat, and viewer with cunning as cash prepared. So he's fixing to demonstrate what it really is. Heimer's caught two whales on a single cast. That's a pretty good haul. There's very few ways to demonstrate the grandiosity of that kind of action than to call two whales, right? So he's got some skill. But this kinsman of Odin, he's going to pay attention. He's going to do the right thing. The warder of men, the worm's destroyer, fixed on his hook the head of the ox. There gaped at the bait, the foe of the gods, the girdler of all the earth beneath. And this is Jormungandr. This is the Midgard serpent. This is the thing that will kill him at Ragnarok. <coughs> the eight begotten term literally means fool. Giants were generally assumed to be stupid. People that are wrapped up in their own egos, and that's the best they can think of, the best they can come up with. That's the limit of their thought process. It's not too far off the truth. Okay. <coughs> The venomous serpent swiftly up to the boat did Thor the bold one pull. With his hammer, he loathly hill of the hair of the brothers of Fenrir. He smote from above. So he's pulled up the Midgard serpent. He's pulled up the very threat to the future of mankind and the gods. He has caught him on the hook, and he's already laid the holy smack down on that candy ass, to borrow a term from the rock. This is a terrifying idea. 
you have a man that's been sitting here talking about how great he is. Then all of a sudden, this guy he's been making fun of pulls up something that will literally change the future of everyone in the world. He has pulled up that thing that threatens our very existence. He is preparing to remove fear from the landscape of men's minds. What could we accomplish if we were not afraid to fail? What could we accomplish if we had faith so powerful that we never had to doubt our ability to move forward in this world? And right here, this very average, ego-driven, simple individual is watching the divine remove fear from the landscape of the human mind, and it terrifies him. What happens to the individual who is so wrapped up in the own smallness of who they are if they let go of all that? What happens to the victim when they no longer are a victim? What happens to the individual who hates, who all of a sudden realizes, I don't need to hate? Do they become less of an individual? Do they become hollow? Do they lose their identity? In some of the most perverse thinking that we have come up with as men, that's exactly what we're terrified of. What happens to me if I quit worrying about this? What happens to me if I quit garnering for myself all the attention that the victim and the sick do? What will my identity be? Well, the order of men is fixing to allow, create an environment where all of that is there. But fear is a powerful motivator. The monster roared and the rocks resounded and all of the earth so old was shaken. <coughs> now, there's a line missing here. Then sank the fish in the sea forthwith. In Eager's feast, at that moment, when Thor is fixing to eliminate those things that hold us back from becoming what we're supposed to become. This individual is so terrified of what he might become if he no longer has that to hold on to, he lurches forward and cuts the line. And that's what will happen to many people when they go out to, to do something great, get on the edge or the cusp of greatness or achievement, and they go home and try to get some kind of encouragement or reinforcement from those individuals. And the average thinking of the, of the regular man can't fathom that. And some shitty comment will be made and the line will be cut. And it happens day in and day out. Watch people talking on the street. Watch the ugly things that happen on TV. People come in and they look for encouragement and support because they're doing something fantastic. And it terrifies the individual who cannot picture what it might be like to go beyond where they are. Usually it's a grandma that'll make some comment like that. <laughs> A truly wise person might say something intelligent. I remember one time there was a lady that I knew, her, her brother-in-law was Pretty Boy Floyd. And I was sitting there at 18 years old, talking to her, trying to sober up and uh, telling her all these great things. And I was really boosting my ego. I was really building up how fantastic I was. She was a real wise lady, and she looked at me, and she said, Brian, I don't know why I should be patting you on the back for doing all those things you should have been doing all along. That's the kind of loving support that we need to be giving each other. If Heimer would have stood up and grabbed a hold of that rope and helped him with that, like that old lady did with me, things would have been much different. She helped pull me into the world to become something. And I did, and I have. The tears, Father, can't do that. Joyless as back they rode was the giant. Speechless did Heimer sit at the oars. With the rudder, he sought a second wind. 
how painful it is to realize that you failed. There's no joy in forcing upon someone else who has the ability to be great an average existence. Kevin Smith said it best when he went to start build, making movies. He said, don't hang out with those people. He said, hang out with the why not people. Anytime you want to go do something, there'll be a lot of people around you that say, well, why do you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. Who do you think you are to try doing something like that? Find yourself a group of people that say, well, why not? Why don't you go give it a shot? Let's see what happens. I bet you can make, let's do something. Those are the kind of people we want to find ourselves surrounded by. So when Tyr goes home to face his father, he knows that his father is going to be one of those individuals. Say, well, why do you want to do that? Ain't nobody else doing that. Who do you think you are? You know, how are you going to pay your bills? Blah, 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 blah. And the strength of the order of men is such that it has the ability to remove from each and every one of us that fear from the landscape of our minds so long as we are willing to let go of those ideas of ego that keep us from supporting, encouraging, and building others. Heimer spake, half of our toil wilt thou have with me, and now make fast our go to the flood. Our home wilt thou bear the whales to the house across the gorge of the wooded glen. Florithy stood, and the stem he gripped, and the seahorse with water or wash he lifted, oars and baler and all he bore with the surf swine home to the giant's house. <laughs> so still, even after all that, to get back to the land, sometimes these ideas are so thoroughly interested in an individual, there is no way to let them go. For Odin, he had to hang on the tree for nine days and nine nights to rid himself of those things that caused him to lose the throne of Asgard. Even right here, this giant's like, he's gonna throw a challenge at him. Why don't you just get the two whales and go on? Thor's like, no, I got this. He picks it all up, boat, giant, whales and all, and carries it all. <laughs> His might, the giant again would match, for stubborn he was with the strength of Thor. The depths of a man's arrogance and egotistical will always challenge the ideas of faith. And this is exactly what's going on here. How strong really are you? What can you overcome? How is your faith going to help you deal with that? And that's what we got to be asking ourselves with regards to this faith, with regards to this way of life, and this attitude, and this also true. What is this faith going to allow us to handle the challenges of life? How will we move forward when it feels like the weight of a boat with two whales and an egotistical giant and all those all of those negative thoughts that come from society come barreling down on our backs. Where is our faith going to let us carry? How is it going to help us move forward? We keep trying. Lorithi then, when the cup he held, struck at the glass, the pillars of stone, and he set the posts and pieces he shattered. I'm sorry, I missed one. None truly strong, thou stoutly he rode, would, ye, would he call save one who could break the cup? So there's a cup in the house, a drink, once again, a, a vessel that will carry that water that is the conduit of faith. Thor then, when the cup he held, struck with glass the pillars of stone, and he set the posts and pieces he shattered, yet the glass to Hymer hold they brought. He gave it a good shot. He broke all the pillars of stone in the house, but uh, he couldn't break the cup. But the loved one fair of the giant found a counsel true and told her thought. Smite the skull of Hymer, heavy with food, for harder it is than ever was glass. So she tells him, strike him down. Beat that glass on his hard head and shatter it. And this is Tyr's mother. So this is the mother providing guidance for the son, even after he's become uh, accomplished and successful. The giant, the goat's mighty ruler, then rose on his knee, and with all of his, all the strength of a god he struck. Who whole was the fellow's helmet stem, but shattered the wine cup round was. So he broke that cup that fed his egotistical right on his own head. Many times that's what will happen in life. We will be strolling along, 
happy with who we think we are. And just like Juanita said to me, I don't know why I should be patting you on the back for doing the things you should have been doing all along. She broke that glass right across my head. Faith broke that and allowed me to become something better. Heimer's spake, and a realization comes upon him. Fair is the treasure that for me is gone. Since now the cup on my knees lie shattered. So spake the giant. No more can I say in days to be, thou art brewed by nail. So he gives it up. He does the right thing and gives him the kettle that they take back to Eager's Hall. Enough shall it be if, you, if out you can bring forth from our house the kettle here. Tyr then twice tried to move it, but before him the kettle twice stood fast. So even after all of that, even after all that's accomplished, Tyr tries to do something without the benefit of that warder of men, without that very powerful representation of faith. He tries to secure from his household, his family, this treasure that he's legitimately earned by going out there and becoming what he's supposed to become. The father of Mothi, the rim seized firm, and before it stood on the floor, floor below. Up on his head, Sif's husband raised it, and about his heels, the handles clattered. Not long had they fared, their backwards looked, the son of Othan once more to see. From their caves in the east beheld he coming with Hymer the throng of the many-headed. He stood and cast from his back the kettle, and mule near the lover of murder he wielded. So all the whales of the waste he slew. <laughs> Even after we have gone out and legitimately secured the treasures of our heritage and who we are with our faith, with the warder of men, with that example and guidance of the North Star, there are still going to be a lot of people more than willing to try and take a step. And they will come out of the woodwork. Every day, it seems like there's someone out there more than willing to make some kind of comment about what they think they know to take a shot at Brian Wilton on the top. But I have a faith that's not going to be shaken by the silly ass comments of individuals who are thoroughly entrenched in that egotistical mindset, we just saw faith destroy. Not long had the affair ere one there lay of Florithy's goats half dead on the ground. In his leg pole horse there was lame the deed the evil Loki had done. <laughs> so the uninspired human intellect and the best way to defend the egotistical thought process of the mind um, tries to cripple faith, tries to cripple the ability of, of success, of faith, of encouragement to move forward. And they will. That's a why not, in, that's a why individual. Why you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. Let me see if I can sabotage that successful effort. It's the uninspired human intellect trying to bring the divine down to a human understanding, the level of human understanding. But ye all have heard for, the, of, for of them who have the tales of the gods who better can tell what prize he won from the wilderness dweller who both his children gave him to boot. The mighty one came to the council of gods and the kettle he had that Hymer's was. So gladly their ale the gods could drink in Eager's Hall in the autumn time. It's the harvest. Is the, har the autumn time is the harvest. In the sea, in that abundant place of life, that conduit of spiritual energy, that source of, of blessing, of encouragement, of nourishment, in the time of autumn when we begin to harvest all those things we've sown throughout the year, in that one, in that effort, who has faced the challenge of who he is and where he's come from, in all of that scene, there's nothing but abundance for those champions that have taken faith, this faith, and gone on to, to handle those challenges that hinder us from becoming what we're supposed to become. Those that need is a very serious idea of changing our thought process, of stepping outside those crippling ideas and attitudes that have hampered the lives of many men. So <laughs> with that, I think next week we'll probably do Eager's Feast because it's a, it follows up to this and it's a, uh, it's a real interesting dialogue between the uninspired human intellect, the egotistical thought process, trying to do his best to handicap our ability to perceive the divine 
and how they may interact with each other. So I appreciate y'all's time this evening. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. And I'll put this up on YouTube and we'll share it. It's pretty quick, fast, in a hurry, but I like that story.